we'll get started. So this is a between a, a very interesting discussion at your lunch. So we want to <laughs> get it situated as quickly as possible and uh, move through our Super, you're doing that. <laughs> uh, Anand, could you also maybe take some notes? Yes. Yeah, so no cross. I'm not going to take really too much. Yeah. yeah. All right. Get seated and uh, we'll be moving. Okay, welcome back. And uh, what we would like to try to achieve in, in this session uh, is something very simple, which is to think back over the presentations we heard in the previous session and tease out the common issues, which by giving some uh, airing them and giving some discussion to them, giving some thought to them, will we think help synthesize and build a program which is more than the sum of the parts. So I've sketched out six topics which I think are common underlying issues across this broad domain of, of education. And um, you're, of course, they're my list, and you're welcome to add more. Um, but I thought they might form at least the beginnings of a, of a basis of conversation. So the first one is simply, what are we trying to achieve? What is the vision for, let's say, five years from now, 2019? Uh, where do we hope to be in the area of cyber GIS education at some point in the future? Maybe five years is a reasonable time frame. Um, who are we trying to reach? Who is the target of this process? And we heard various versions of that within the various presentations from the fellows. Um, we heard uh, ideas about building the next generation of cyber GIS builders, the rather technically expert um, end of the spectrum. Um, we also heard about reaching the domain sciences. We heard about, for example, um, programs that are targeted towards urban planners, or we might have programs that are targeted towards hydrologists. Um, given that a major focus, a major objective of this entire project is to provide infrastructure for science. And so if we can reach the domain sciences with cyber GIS, that would be all well and good. Um, the issue, of course, is that there are so many of them, and reaching all of them is clearly impossible. Um, so this would require some kind of prioritization. It would make sense to, to target particular domain sciences, as we, in effect, did on, on Tuesday. So the first set of questions has to do with what we're trying to achieve. The second has to do with leverage, because in any educational project, there is a vast marketplace, a vast number of people out there to reach. If we targeted even a specific domain science, like ecology, we could argue that we need to reach on the order of 10,000 people, researchers, NSF supported perhaps researchers in, in ecology. So how to get leverage? Do we get leverage best by producing material online and doing our best to draw attention to it? Or do we get leverage by teaching the teachers, by bringing together workshops of people who then, in a pyramid scheme, will then reach a larger community. And these are the kinds of arguments which I'm sure are very familiar to anybody who's thought about curriculum development. Um, leverage is, is a key issue. Um, third, there is the GI Science and Technology Body of Knowledge version two. And we need to think about what our contribution is going to be. That project is developing. Um, I, I, th I suspect that our best strategy there is to go ahead and do it, to develop a cyber GIS contribution to Body of Knowledge 2. Because I think waiting for the project as a whole to tell us to do that is going to introduce further delays. 
Then there's the development of materials and a lot of questions about the materials. What format will they eventually take? Um, what can we do in the way of assisting the producers of those materials in their career advancement? They can already identify themselves as a fellow. Can we have a process of peer review which will then allow them to claim these things as peer reviewed materials, part of their creative contribution? Um, do we have, can we develop a, a standard method of citation of these materials so that they can be put in CVs? Then there's outreach to the domain sciences and this whole question of, of targeting and how to do that effectively. And then the last question which occurred to me with several of the presentations, which is what do we expect in the way of prerequisites? What kind of foundation education do our target audiences need to have in order to tackle these, these materials that we're producing? So those are six issues which, to me, seem to be common and worth discussing or at least thinking about um, in this session as a way of trying to build synthesis around this program. Um, I, as I said earlier, there the six that occurred to me. Um, there may well be many more in your own minds. Um, and let's spend the next few minutes um, thinking about this and um, suggesting ways of, of addressing these and other questions. Okay. Shall we? Shall we? Hello. Hello. Yes. <laughs> uh, just to add a point, um, the purpose of this session, what do we want to get out of this session in the end? Uh, we discussed, Karen, Mike, uh, and I discussed before we come into the session. So we hope to be able to come up with a set of guidelines and the principles for the fellows going back to their institutions to roll up their sleeves to execute their projects. We hope in the next a few weeks to be able to provide such principles and guidelines for executing the fellows' projects. So this is uh, the session uh, after which we, uh, three of us will come up with the draft and uh, circulate with the fellows. Karen, anything you would like to add? I, I would very much like to, to hear the comments from everybody here on all your points, because I think uh, we need to your contribution will help us bring some clarity to this plan to develop the guidelines and principles. So that's my, please go ahead. Um, just a comment on a, a body of knowledge. I, uh, somewhere on the team, uh, Mary Roderick was kind of spearheading it. We are trying to get an input into the next version. Uh, do you want to talk about it, Mary? I got the final feedback from the technical team members late last week, and I've already started compiling that um, and structuring it into a document. So there is some movement forward on that. This is, again, from the technical team level, though, so that'll need to go up the ladder to the executive committee um, and receive your input, Great. of course. And, and let me just emphasize, to for those of you who are not familiar with this, th it's, this is exactly what it says. It's a body of knowledge. It's not curriculum material. It's not teaching material. It's simply a statement of what people should know if they are to be experts in this particular part of, of uh, GI science and technology. And I think the important piece for us is to, to tie to the BOK is that whatever materials we're producing, we will see the link to the BOK. The BOK, will, our little piece of it, will actually contain components that reflect our materials. So the the, the nice opportunity we have here is actually to build the body of knowledge and then to build the knowledge materials as well. So these two things can reflect as we evolve through here. And so the body of knowledge will become a very substantial statement of what we believe people need to know, rather than just a bunch of people scribbling down some ideas on a piece of paper. Tim. 
and we should be clear that there are actually, in a sense, two thrusts here, because the project is a research thrust in terms of what the body of knowledge is, and that's what Mary is trying to coordinate. But there is the CyberGIS Fellows, which is an educational thrust, and undoubtedly they're connected there. But they can work in, guess what, parallel <laughs> fashion. We don't have to have one waiting on the other for right. input. So we right. have a, a parallel approach there, and then see what we come out yeah. uh, toward the end there, maybe in the ninth month, as it would be of uh, your time. May. Yeah, I think that it's very difficult for anybody really try to comprehensively cover all the topics in CyberGIS. But I think that we might come up with a coordinated uh, community effort to contribute different lessons, then that those lessons can be used by everybody to teach CyberGIS in their own institute. Mm -hmm. So for example, then then Gober, he is very good at the infrastructure side and programming side of Sample GIS. Maybe he can focus on develop those lessons. And Nina is really good at develop the application side of the, the uh, lessons, so she can contribute to those lessons. And it depends on our uh, expertise and our resources. Then we can you know maybe in the Cyber GIS website to have different uh, modular area so that everybody can contribute one or two lessons to those modular area with uh, maybe video lectures and exercises that along with it. So everybody, if we only need to develop one or two lessons, it's a much a more low than develop a whole class yeah. at once. Yeah, when we were discussing the various fellowship applications, um, we were very keen on the idea of complementarity, mm -hmm. that the, the set that was selected, the winners, um, should be doing complementary pieces. And so that's why I think this session is important because what we're trying to do is to pull the various pieces into a coherent whole. So synthesis is important here. Dan? Oh. Um, so David. Mike, one thing I'd, I'd like to hear more response on, but, but in, in the idea of how to get leverage is to actually talk about instead of just teaching other ways to make cyber G GIS feel more accessible. Mm. And I think for a lot of members of the GIS science community who already have access to programmers or do some themselves, they, they could walk into this meeting and actually be very conversant and engaged, but it seems so distant the way we present it sometimes, because mm. we're talking about the farthest outer edge with a lot of the research we're talking yeah. about. And I wonder whether it's case studies mm. that just show some exciting opportunities, or, or maybe even, you know, almost like a tangible example of what someone could do if they got that chance for a little time uh, on, on one of these computers. What, you know, what is something that, that an ecologist um, or someone that just goes to other GI science meetings could do with just a little more programming and a little computer time? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not even on Blue Waters, but on something something they normally wouldn't use. Yeah. Good idea. Case studies, examples of best practice. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. Sure. So in the project, uh, very specific to what you suggested, uh, Dave Tarbleton, who presented the first day, and Dave Maidman, they've been collaborating for teaching hydroinformatics, GIS, for years. So the Tao Dim application, some of the team members presented, will be made available in that class in this September. We are specifically designing interfaces and capabilities for teaching purpose in that process. And we're looking forward to sharing the process and outcome as part of this fellows exercises. Xiaowen, in your introductory slides, you had a categorization of the fellows activity. And so I'm wondering, was that from you alone, or did you, Mike, and Karen get together and do that uh, categorization? And it responds to, in a sense, what May had mentioned about 
given all of the things that could possibly be in cyber GIS. These are the things right now that in the cyber GIS fellows, this is what's going forward in this world, plus the research activity as well. But again, as we're saying, there's lots, and David just said, there's lots of research thrusts that could be out there. But from an organizational perspective, when you synthesize, Mike, you mentioned synthesize some of these ideas and so on, I'm just wondering, can we talk a little bit about Shaowen? But I don't know, whose, whose categorization scheme is it? Uh, it is what I suggested, but I sent to all the executive committee mem members, including yourself. <laughs> and that occurred when? Occurred during summer uh, with the reminders. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think let me get Did to anybody the, comment? So. Uh, a few, but let me get to the bottom of your question. I think this is uh, bottom up versus top down. And I think these two approaches need to be synergized. and. Uh, you know, process-oriented thinking at which stage we need to go forward with top-down or bottom-up. Uh, with the proposals and the selection process, we did have top-down thinking, which was that categorization. But now, with the presentations, this process help us maybe driving toward in the middle between top-down and bottom-up. I think it's too early to my personal opinion. I would love to hear critiques and the feedbacks, it's too early to come up with a top-down structure at this stage. Oh, I oh, fully agree, because without the empirical, the, the realm of what's out there, because that's how a top-down would actually, some, some generalization across a number of diverse set of, uh, so yeah, I mean, the project's been so successful going bottom-up, we should just continue with the bottom-up strategy and put stuff out there. Okay, uh, so I just wanted to uh, respond a little bit to May's comment, which also touches on number four there, which is very, very important for most of us who are assistant professors. So if we were just writing papers about these topics and submitting them to an edited collection or a textbook, my tenure and promotion committee would understand that. They would know how to value that. Um, that is the typical model, right? So what we're talking about here, making digital materials available, interactive, sharing them with lots of different communities is the way that it should be going. But I don't know that my own department would know how to handle it. So I don't know the answer to that, but I would look to my senior, wiser, full professor friends in here and members of TNP committees, maybe for some guidance of how I could explain these types of contributions to my department or maybe even come up with a paper describing why these are important and send them somewhere. Because yeah. what we're doing is we're writing a textbook and we're putting it online mm -hmm. and making it available, shareable, easily accessible. Yeah. And it's really important to do that. I think there are three things that we need to bear in mind. One is this has to be creative and it has to be your creation. So there's a clear notion of authorship. Right? Secondly, there needs to be peer review and so you can you know, without any ambiguity, put this in the peer-reviewed list. And then third, the citation needs to resemble a classic citation. And as a web book, that's very easy to do. You give the book a title, you make it look like a book, you have page numbers. The only difference is that it's online. It doesn't have a publisher. And that, I think, should now, these days, uh, be equally impressive to a tenure committee as a standard book published by Wiley or whatever. So I think if we, if we make those three things work, then we can ensure that these are um, countable contributions in everybody's CV. Um, my name's Aileen Buckley. I'm a cartographer and I work here at Esri. And um, I want to go back to the point that was made about putting out case studies that are so compelling that people want to replicate them or learn from them and apply them to their own work. I think a real opportunity exists if those case studies end up with this awesome visualization that could go viral that then would get people to look at what you're doing because what's not going to go viral is a bunch of code that is going to you know, demonstrate cyber infrastructure. What would go viral is a, 
a demonstration of how what you're doing can solve a real world problem or help people to build knowledge about the world around us through the end product, which I believe, because it's cyber GIS, is most often going to be a map. And um, it occurs to me now having, well, no, it's occurred to me the whole time, that a lot of what I've been seeing really doesn't get to that end product where the demonstration of the value is through a, a visualization that informs, intrigues, and, and captures the attention of the audience. So I just would like to see a little bit more focus on the visualization. There's a huge cartographic and computer science community working in this area. They're not well represented here. And I think the ties between the two, between the types of people in this room and that larger community would be really fruitful in communicating the value of the work that's being done here. Thank you. It might be a nice principle to put into our guidelines that everyone move towards producing a good visualization in the process of the materials so that everything has some really good visualizations and, and we probably need some support to get people there, but I think that would be a good idea. It would also be a good little thumbnail. So, um. I, I'm going to need to take off, okay. um, leaving, and leaving me taking notes everything and everything in your capable hands. You guys talking, and Shawen can help. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you right. for your overview and insight, as always. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, he's leaving. We're continuing. All right, I'm playing Mike. Go ahead. Uh, May. <laughs> I, I just want to respond to Dan's question. Um, as I'm an American editor for IJGIS, I will be more than happy to discuss the possibility of having manuscripts in that nature to publish in IJGIS. I don't know uh, the exact uh, format that can pass through the uh, peer review process, but I think that we can be creative in a way that to make sure the manuscript with the education emphasis still can be published. But I was thinking more holistically about the output of all 13 different projects, right? So the, the specific project that Karen has is very difficult, right? So how are you going to wrap all this up into a package that someone can read start to finish and say, got it? <laughs> And then how would we take that whole thing of 13 separate projects which are interrelated and turn that into one product? Unless it were a special issue of IJGIS of a lot of its educational materials too, I, right? I don't think we're going for one product here. We're going for one comprehensive whole, whole. but it's yeah, not sorry. necessarily one product. It's, it's a collection that has a, a binder around it, Yeah, I think. Um, so that, that, in fact, uh, leaves you to be your own author of your own thing as a part of the larger collection. So it'll be like an like a edited volume in a way. And maybe that would be one way to put it out there is this is the uh, fellows, 2014 fellows volume. Um, and then it would have numbers and pages. We could links to lots of other things, but we could produce it as a volume that way. So does, would this fall into the category of sprinkles? So what? sprinkles on ice cream. Um, so specifically, book chapters have been described to me as sprinkles. They're, they're not very good by themselves, but if you put them on top of an ice cream bowl filled with IJGIS papers, then they are delicious. So what people who have sat on T&P committees, how would you view this? I know Mike's comment was if it's peer reviewed and blah, 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 then it's people are going to value it the same way. I don't think my department is in that place. Right. I really don't. So I'd be interested to hear from people who could potentially be evaluating these things when I go up for tenure. What do you think? This is probably not an unbiased audience, though. So <laughs> that's a question for everybody. And it's a question. It's, it's absolutely a question that we have to, we have to hit okay. head on. So. 
Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So I. Hey, I was no. earlier. So okay. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I'm. I'm actually. My question was not really responding to. But since you asked, um, you could. I mean, typically for tenure promotions, you assistant professor, you have research, teaching, and professional services. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as, as long as you have a very good teaching portfolio, creativities, um, that's, you already get almost one half of the tenure promotion uh, criteria being met. So, um, I mean, you know, since you are doing teaching anyway, and why not teach in a creative way? So anyway, I'm, I'm not <laughs> in your department, so I, but my, my real question is that um, for these sessions, are we just limiting to the fellows? Do we want to invite anybody who have uh, cyber GIS material to contribute to that, to this? That's what Dan's gonna do. Dan's gonna collect all that stuff. <laughs> so in fact, actually, that's a, that's a valid point. And the, the question of whether the project as a whole is going to solicit and collect these materials or whether it's going to come through Dan's process, which may be an efficient way of doing it. Ah, okay. Oh, right, yours is, that's true. Um, I think we need to figure out how to do that because one of the things is if we just ask for stuff, we're just gonna have stuff. And, and how does all that stuff fit together? Is it useful if it's just a big box of stuff? Um, I think maybe we need to get a little bit more structured in what we think we need and then pull in the stuff. Perhaps. Yeah, I would agree in um, spirit, Karen, what you just said. I think initially we would be focusing on the fellows projects. Yeah. That would uh, help inform us a better framework and structure organizing what would be more community-based crowd approach to more comprehensive and representative contributions. But uh, this is still a learning process um, initially. I think Sir has something to offer. Yeah, following up on uh, Nina's response, I think I was really impressed with the proposals. They were fascinating. And I think they should be couched as really creative teaching. Mm -hmm. That's going to take time. and you need to think about your portfolio. So one suggestion I would make maybe to pursue is to talk to your department chairs and see if you can get buyout for this endeavor so that your research time quote, doesn't take a hit because of this very important effort. That might be something to pursue because you have external validation in the sense that you're a fellow. So I think that, at least in our school, I think that would be something that would be received pretty well. Well, <laughs> it's worth a try. Otherwise, you have to figure out a way to couch this as a research effort if you wanted to count for research. Yeah. Yeah. Dom and, and Tim. Along the, the, guy, the, uh, the idea of the, the tenure and promotion uh, process and the cultures on different campuses are so different, and there, there's some things that will be accepted for someone's promotion dossier on one campus that will absolutely be rejected on another. So. Uh, one of the things that, that I found to be helpful was just to go to my chair and my dean with a, a, a proposed idea and to ask outright, will this be acceptable on my dossier? So that, that's one, one little tidbit that I would give as, as one of the older folks uh, for, for you, Dan, and for others. And toward that end, we've been talking, uh, I think, about a compilation or an edited volume of stuff, as, as Karen puts it, uh, Mike mentioned a, a web book, an online book, and whether or not something like that is, is acceptable. So if something, if whatever these ideas that are developing uh, become more crystallized, you sh I think you should take that idea to your chair or your dean and say, look, this is happening, I'm participating, I'm a cyber GIS fellow, and is this going to be acceptable on my dossier? Yes or no, please. So that, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, Mike had mentioned 
uh, the idea of an online book that can be peer reviewed and that should have some moniker of the traditional citation uh, process on it. And one of those is a digital object identifier. Uh, there, there are others that can be, that have the, the street cred, so to speak. So I just wanted to mention that uh, we have Esri here, but we also have Esri Press. And Esri Press now is becoming more and more involved in peer reviewed monographs, not just uh, case study books, uh, map gallery books, they're all fantastic. Uh, software documentation, that's been fantastic, but Esri Press is really evolving now uh, into these other, other realms. So there may be uh, a way for, for Esri Press uh, to, to assist in your efforts. Uh, your, your online book may be hosted uh, at the Cyber GIS in that infrastructure, but there may be a way that, that Esri Press can, can work with you guys. And we are now, uh, I, I can say we because I'm working more closely with Esri Press in my role at Esri, and Esri Press is getting into the business now of minting DOIs, so that, that's just one idea. Eileen, excuse me. Do you want when you a have microphone? When you have the microphone. Yeah. It's a recorded. Sorry. Just no. Two quick notes. It also has an academic imprint, so they like published one of the uh, cartographic textbooks, and it also is publishing now eBooks. And yeah. if you have a contract with them they will take your content and put it into ebook format for you. Go ahead, Tim. Along the lines of addressing your a major issue, Dan, it really in some sense is connecting research and teaching. So you're doing research about teaching. There's, you should, all of you fellows should have no question, no doubt about what you're doing. This is a research project that links to an education activity, so really that's what it is. But the fundamental issue, and this is what Dan and I have talked about many times, is you all have to learn something about evaluation. And so what I'm gonna ask the executive, executive committee, that's I guess Xiao Wen, Mike, and Karen on this activity. Karen, as I understand, your proposal was about evaluation. I believe it was in the title. So I would like to ask the three of you to provide some at least minimal guidelines for how the fellows can evaluate their work. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that framework, whatever minimal framework that is, and if all of you are doing it to that framework, then you have a basis to share with each other and you can justify that there is an evaluation component in your work that you're doing. And so it's gonna be a challenge to come up with some minimal evaluation perspective there. But I know uh, Dan's been really keen on this for the last several years as a, a part of a, uh, the educational issue that we face here. But if you look at evaluation is the core to the research aspect mm -hmm. of teaching, then I think you're gonna have uh, more success with moving forward. Part of my intention, it's not, it's not specifically evalu evaluation, but which might come in the context of evaluating it actually being taught. Um, but I certainly had an intention to ensure that all the materials were properly structured with things like learning objectives and, and you know, really, really clear uh, intentions and things like that. So the materials are really good quality materials to create a, a kind of template that would be flexible across them for the teaching materials. Um, but the, the question of evaluation, it, it, that actually could be quite interesting that as people are putting their courses together, they actually run some, you know, pre and post tests or whatever. Yeah, good point. Now, there, there are many strategies that one can use for the evaluation process. So. And uh, for Karen's proposal, we did tie evaluation and dissemination together because we want to make sure before broad dissemination, the quality is getting assured. And this is going to be peer reviewed. I think Mike was already alluded to. I think we have the leverage of the project uh, senior colleagues who we could um, take advantage of their expertise in the peer review process. Of course, we could also make this more open to recruit 
uh, external folks to the project to be part of uh, the peer review uh, in process. But then uh, your question actually reminded me, uh, I have uh, three tenure cases for research one universities due uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, what I see this is, you already scored a high point by winning the fellows. Uh, that's your teaching excellence signal on your CV. Now, I think your question is about whether you can turn your exercise into research excellence. That, uh, I think, is a vague, vague zone uh, for assessment, external assessment. But uh, given we are seeing moving forward in this opportunities and challenges space, I think uh, you are likely facing to external reviewers of your dossier uh, to be uh, positively consider the kind of contributions you are making. But the importance is uh, at UIUC, I think uh, many other schools, research one universities, uh, although the fellows are representing different kinds of institutions, but for research one university in the research context, there is also uh, a category generally referred to as creative work. This type of work we're considering is more fitting to that. Um, so that is what we're considering. I don't think there's a, as some other colleagues suggested earlier, there's a, a one-fits-all model for, for the kind of schools we're we are considering. Uh, I'd agree. Um, I'm actually least concerned about mine mm -hmm. being evaluated as research because I'm doing You're just, doing research. Um, yeah, mine is go collect materials, synthesize them, come up with mm -hmm. things out of it. The ones that were, I'm going to augment my class to add these modules, unless you do IRB, you would not be allowed to study it and publish it as number one that people should know. Right? So if that's going to be part of the evaluation, which we're going to be required to do, everyone who's doing a project needs to get cracking on your IRB application right now. Otherwise, it will be non-publishable. Mm -hmm. So mine, I think, is actually on the side which isn't going to be too hard to cast as research. It's uh, it seems to me that one thing might be really nice for us to put in place immediately for this group is a task to have everyone go talk to their chairs and discuss this topic and then blog it. So amongst the group to post the result of your meeting with your chair about whether this is going to be useful and what, what they heard and what they told you and share it with all the rest of us so that the strategies can be passed between, group, between the, the group of fellows. I think it's a great idea and I might um make a small request. I think we've beat this getting value out of being a fellow thing to death, so maybe we want to switch topics Thank to you. something else in the well, list. But that's perhaps a, an opportunity for a little bragging um, as well while you're talking to your chairs or deans. Uh, a question switching gear as Dan, you were suggesting. I was curious what coordination, communication mechanisms and infrastructure we need to consider to put into place for the fellows to uh, get organized and uh, also help inform each other's work. Yeah, what do you guys want? Uh, one would be just to start meeting on a maybe every other week basis with the groups that you grouped us into because I think those were pretty natural. Mm -hmm. And maybe Karen would be a very good person to be the coordinator. So you have a vision of or knowledge of what's happening amongst all of them and can maybe help to glue us all together a little bit to give you work. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm in Hawaii, so I can meet anytime. <laughs> you guys, we can meet at 10 at night if you like. It's still the middle of my day. Um, yeah, we absolutely need to have meetings. That's clear. Actually, the point about whether we group is an interesting thing. And I think we might need a little, a cycle or two on how, we, how everyone feels they ought to be grouped, um, who they want to be uh, working with. Um, Good, yes. Uh, I want to add a plug actually from an activity that I work with with Nancy. Um, Exceed has uh, the concept of a campus champion fellow. You represent um, kind of cyber infrastructure and you provide expertise for cyber infrastructure both locally at your own institution and for things like Exceed, which is kind of what hosts the uh, campus fellows or the campus champions themselves, then they had their fellowship program. So I'm talking about campus champions here. They have a mailing list that is fantastic um, for computer-related questions. 
So it might be nice to just set up a mailing list, um, you know, so that when we're talking to our deans, you could say, you know, this is what they said, somebody can respond, oh, did you think of this, you know, and everything else, because the, the um, campus champion mailing list is just wonderful. Somebody has a question, somebody has an idea, and within you know, minutes, you have you know, 12 responses. I mean, there's a few hundred of them, so it, it, the, the scale's a little different, but that might be a good way to get you know, rapid feedback without having to set up or wait for, a, for the next telephone call. Another way, if I could make a pitch for my own project, uh, would be a lot of the courses are the same course or have similar components of one piece of a course in a different course. So instead of us all going out and redeveloping, things which we're all proposing to do. Maybe we should sh set up a, a Dropbox or a Google Drive folder where we could put the materials we're comfortable sharing in there, specifically our Intro to GIS programming courses. Um, so that way, people who are working on similar things can, can at least see and have some material and not have to develop it all from scratch. I think that would help in the efficiency of everything going. I think we could do both, mailing list and document sharing. Doesn't it seem that also right away we need to figure out who's, who is teaching similar courses and in fact whether a piece that person A is doing and said person B was g gonna do the same thing that maybe they should shift off a little bit of the workload and focus more, like try to distribute the concentrations a little bit or else we wanna have two versions of things. But I think it'd be really nice right at the beginning for us to have that conversation about you know, trying to link all the pieces, see where they fit in a matrix. I, yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, and I, I would disagree that we want two people developing the same thing independently. I think you get a better product if they work together or one person takes the first pass and the second person comes in right. and reviews it for them. I think that that might be a little challenging just given the diversity. I, I mean, I, I agree actually. Um, I think that you'll end up with a better product, but I think that all of us customize the material for the situation and the students that are at our local institutions. So I, I, I fully agree. I actually think if we listed all of our lessons and all of our activities that we're planning on doing in a master list and then you know, start grouping, you know, anybody who's doing Python programming and needs to introduce it, let's all get together and start talking about it. Because there are things that overlap regardless, but then maybe the custom tailoring bits mm -hmm. will still be left to the individual to customize it for their students, whether it you know, has a particular domain focus or not. Has, has uh, any of the fellows <laughs> felt uh, somebody's doing exactly the same thing as you were thinking after the presentations? Or you feel like, as I did, for the most part are quite complementary to each other's work? Complimentary. <laughs> I think we don't have all of our fellows up. Maybe we could talk about the last one on the screen right now. Um, which, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have to make this all the same or even maybe state it now, but it, it is an important piece as we're putting this together is to be sure it's clear where you're starting in each case. You know, what's the, what's the foundational knowledge you think your students are going to have because we need to be really clear. So we can have all those different levels. Where are you? There you are, yes. Her levels, uh, you know, something like that. So we have maybe some clarity about the level that students that you're writing for, that you're coming towards. That might be a really useful thing to try to clarify. Like Eric was mentioning, that's going to be different for every class. So that might be hard. I, I also think that that's changing. So at Kent, we hired several GIS faculty, including myself. And one of the things that we're talking about right now is it's very difficult, I think, because of uh, the wide variety of classes to fill up all of the classes. So we've actually been talking about lowering the prerequisites. And I've been doing that actually in some of my classes. Uh, it helps lower the barriers and allow business students to enter my classes, which is great. But I think over time, we'll actually start developing deeper pipelines that we typically see in computer science, where you know you have computer science one, two, three, then you know advanced topics X, Y, and Z. 
Um, but uh, I think that, you know, as we're beginning, maybe the prerequisites are a little lower, and then, you know, as, as we move forward, they might change a little bit. So I don't think it's necessarily a, a, static, a static picture either, just something to throw out there. So we didn't talk at all about numero uno up there. So what are our wishes, hopes, and dreams? So one for me would be that this room is more full the next time this conference takes place. I would like to see more actual undergrads here and grad students. Um, linkage with outside of academia. So what does Shell look for in a cyber GI scientist? Right, so we're somewhat insulated here. We're mostly academics, um, but the people we're graduating, the vast majority of them, are not going into academia. So I see a lot of my job is training people so they're very prepared when they get to the job. They get the best jobs possible. They get the most money possible. So they have a good value from their education. So I, I would like to see us interact with actual you know, domain segments, not just domain sciences, because that's more academics. That's Sh actually a good question for Shawan, sorry, about yeah. the role of the domain industries as opposed to the domain science scientists. Um, how, how have you been interacting with the domain industries at this point? The people who actually hire the people, not just the scientists. Yeah, I think one of the aspirations of organizing a meeting at ESRI this year, in fact, is very much related to the point you are making. We hope to synergize the cyber GIS evolution at this point with what industry is considering to be um, very cutting edge. Uh, to their interests, and we know ASRI is well connected to you know, a lot of other industries. Uh, we hope to, as Mike was making the analogy, right, you teach teachers or you teach students, right? You uh, cannot ignore this is getting streamed and my uh, plan to get all the videos and presentations online and it's going out of the world, Don is tweeting, you know. This is, uh, I think it's a uh, very significantly broader impact uh, using NSF language to describe what we're trying to achieve. Um, at this stage, uh, the project itself is very much research intensive. Uh, and uh, you um, generally understand that we have to balance in a program like this between research and broader impacts, intellectual merits and broader impacts. And broader impacts compared to intellectual merits, that's uh, a smaller piece. Uh, we want to make sure the cutting edge research is getting pushed as hard as possible. Uh, and putting a program like this getting close to 100 people uh, for a project like this is pretty ambitious. Yeah. But your point is well taken, and uh, we did consider this seriously. That's one of the reasons we partnered with ESRI and uh, Steve and Don David did a fantastic job and uh, getting us all hosted pretty well. Yes, yeah, so I think leveraging the this the dispersion that ESRI has into many different industries it will, it's very good for us, mm -hmm. but it would also be good to have actual users, mm -hmm. ESRI customers here, like Schlumberger in Houston, huge, huge supercomputing user. Mm -hmm. So those types of organizations that would hire someone graduating from my program, ESRI can't hire every single GIS graduate in the world, um, so they have to go somewhere. We don't want them all, we just want the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> so specifically to your comment about Shell, what is Shell looking for? So Shell is actually a really interesting use case for cyber GIS because Shell has, uh, if you remember back on Jack's slide about, you know, whether you have, you know, GIS on the open internet or GIS on, on, your, on your internal network. So Shell has their own, say, cyber GIS on their own network scattered all over the world you know, petabytes of data, thousands of licenses of Esri technology. Um, so they're looking for Python programmers, for JavaScript programmers, for ArcGIS server administrators, for, you know, Amazon ninjas for running all their ArcGIS stuff on EC2 and things like that. And they're, you know, they're, they're one example from one industry. Most of the major people in that industry have a very similar thing going on. People in the Intel community, same thing, you know. NGA basically has a copy of ArcGIS online with all that stuff in it, you know, on their network. So 
We actually have a, a, a product, in a sense. Not very many people buy it, but it's basically ArcGIS Online in a box, you know, and it's like, you know, I don't know what it is now, 40 terabytes of data and stuff, you know, and you basically install the rack in your system and spin it up and you have all that data that's in ArcGIS Online and all those analytic services, but on your local network, you know, for your people. So, so taking, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to, but I, I do like the idea that in the future, you know, when we do this, we should sort of um, open reach. up the tent a little bit more and get some of those people in the room to talk about, you know, their experiences and how they can, you know, further leverage some of the work that you guys are doing from the research side. Can, can I build on that real quick, Shawin? Just because we've had a similar experience at the first CyberGIS meeting. It was my first CyberGIS meeting. It was right before UCGIS in Washington, where the, there was a big snowmageddon situation a couple years back. And um, all of the federal agencies were there, and they were all talking to UCGIS in that case, but there were CyberGIS people there about what they were looking for in uh, students, essentially skill sets, what they want students coming out of the, your programs in universities to be able to do. And I was, I thought it was fascinating. It was just so interesting. And so I think um, Dan Katz mentioned that the NSF provides money for workshops related to undergraduate education, for example, and, and generally educa education. So if possible, with, I know you have a short time frame, so it may uh, I mean, relatively short. It may not, there may not be time to find NSF funding to do the workshop to bring some key people that Esri already has partnerships. Esri should be there as well. And then uh, Domain Industries. But similar to that UCGIS uh, workshop where the federal agencies came and gave the same kind of information. Um, it seems like that would be an excellent thing to organize, separate from our Cyber GIS conference. Yeah, connecting the dots, right? Yeah. And also engagement of uh, students. I think those are two key points. Yeah. But uh, taking the spirit, if I may, of uh, Steve's example, I want to go back to the first question raised there. So what, where are we going? Why this is uh, so exciting? Uh, as I was characterizing, perhaps I'm too excited. Uh, this is uh, not planned to be just a one shot one round of CyberGS fellows. That was not at all the intention. When this idea was debated in the CyberGS project, this uh, came with uh, a lot of discussions with Tim. The idea is that this is a, a sustainable activity and we see this as just a planting seeds. Uh, in the CyberGS project, uh, we do have funds left to run this competition for one more time and that's, again, still viewed as a seeding. Uh, the long term, take, again, Steve's example for that uh, concrete real world situation. There are tremendous needs and the rapid development. Huge demand for, you could say, transforming education, both materials and processes. So if you folks here, being the first set of seeds, and uh, you imagine your materials getting cited and used, your creative work gets broad and deep impact into the future of CyberGS education. I think NSF will go in after us to say, how could we support you better for nurturing the future CyberGS scientists and changing the way the digital transformation better the science and engineering as a whole? So, Dan's in the room. Okay, I believe he agreed with what I said. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very extraordinary opportunity. I think that's a great label for us to keep working towards all of our things. We should be thinking of them being expressed in the context of transformative education. Let's just get all this stuff to look like transformative education. Mm -hmm. That would be very powerful. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a matter of language. And that's all, you just have to, have to speak it. Cool? Yeah, so who, for those of you who are not a fellows, you are connected to future prospective fellows. Keep what uh, I said in your mind, um, as a, I would anticipate another round of uh, 
competition, and uh, we do hope this is a, a community-driven exercise, as I put it in my presentation title, because that is what I believe is going to lead to the desirable success we hope to achieve. Karen, you have any final words? So we have some work ahead of us. Um, I think uh, perhaps Shawin and I and whoever else is appropriate, maybe Jonathan, um, there you are, um, to, to start sketching out the guidelines and principles that we want to suggest to everyone. We need to organize some conversations. And actually, I was just sitting here thinking, wondering whether it would be useful for me to have a conversation with each one of you just a phone call. We can just talk about what we heard here and what we think might be the right way for each individual person to move forward and, and just to have that, let you get whatever you thought off your chest. Um, and then start uh, organizing some of this collaborative group work. Tim, <laughs> um, you can probably help direct us in that too. Um, so uh, whatever we need, the master lists and all these other things things and drop boxes and all that, we'll need to organize that. So there's a lot to get on the ground right away. I'm going to Europe for all of September. <laughs> we'll see how that works. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, that's, we got lots to do. We just have to get our act together. Thanks. Any final word from the audience? Yeah. I have a final word. I want to take the opportunity of introducing Jonathan Rush in the audience, if you might stand up. <laughs> so Jonathan, just to join us, uh, the UIUC Cyber GIS Center as Education Outreach Training Coordinator. Um, <laughs> recognizing the tremendous opportunities we were characterizing and uh, also, of course, you see the challenges. They're all generally coming together opportunities and challenges. And you see this is uh, not only just as we were describing uh, simply fellows level activities because of the support generally was limited. Uh, in this case, we're leveraging a campus investment to help facilitate the interactions among the fellows, assist Karen, especially in the evaluation and the dissemination, um, which we thought is a critical piece of the puzzle. So welcome on board, and uh, I think Jonathan has made so many connections at the conference already. If uh, you are curious about his aspirations and a vision, feel free to self-introduce to him, and, uh, and we look forward to building up the community. Thank you.